The Voice of Russia World Service presents another program in the series The Christian Message from Moscow with me, your host Boris Novikov. tell you about Saint Theodosius of Kiev. The true birth of the Russian monasticism is associated with the Monastery of the Caves, the Pechorske Lavra in Kiev. Without any help from the powers that be, it was founded in the 11th century solely as the fruit of the spiritual endeavor, the fasts and tears, as the chronicle puts it, of Russian monks. The founder and the spiritual guide of that monastery was Saint Theodosius. He and his teacher, Saint Anthony, were called by the chronicler, the first great candles to be lit in the name of the land of Russia before the universal image of Christ. Saint Anthony received his monastic habit during his pilgrimage to Saint Athos. The hegumen of the great monastery told him, Go back to Russia, and may blessing of the holy mountain come down upon you. You will be a father of many monks. Followers were quick to start coming to share Anthony's life. One day a young pilgrim, Theodosius, the man who is sometimes called Saint Benedict of Russia, joined them. Theodosius spent his childhood in the towns of Vasilkov and Kursk, where his father, a man of distinction, was a judge. From his childhood, maturing in body and mind, he felt himself attracted out of love of God to the church. He never played with other children to dedicate himself entirely to the Holy Scriptures. His clothes were rough and patched, and when his parents offered him others, he refused because he wanted to be like common people. At his request, his parents invited a teacher, and everyone was soon amazed by the pace of his progress and his knowledge. The boy was thirteen when his father died. Theodosia's mother was strongly against her son's pious endeavors. She was a strong woman and merely by the round of her voice, without being seen, might have been taken for a man. Theodosius made up his mind to go secretly to the Holy Land and took to the road, only to be recaptured by his mother and taken home where heavy chains were the reward for his pious initiative. They were taken off only when he promised to never try make the journey again. Making the holy loaves for the church with his own hand, Theodosius used to sell all that was left and handed out the money to the poor. Despite his mother's rebukes, your work brings shame to the family, she used to say, Theodosius never strayed from his path to follow the example of Christ who lived all his earthly existence in poverty and humility. When hired as a servant to the governor's house, Theodosius gave all the rich clothes presented to him away to the poor brethren, and it was not twice or thrice that he did so. Theodosius continued his reading of these scriptures. He was struck by that passage of the gospel which declares that he who puts his father and mother before Christ is unworthy of our Savior. He made up his mind to give up the world and, when his mother was away, fled to Kiev. Found by God's providence, St. Anthony's cave, fell to his knees 
and pleaded the holy man to let him stay. The saint replied, My child, let us praise God that has given you the strength for such a vocation. My dwelling is very cramped, my life is hard, and you are very young, but your place is here. Stay with me. Theodosia's mother was beside herself with anger and despair at the thought she would never have a chance of talking with her beloved son anymore. In the end, Master St. Anthony persuaded Theodosius to see his mother. Theodosius told her, If you desire to see me every day, go into the city and join a women's monastery. Then you will be able to see me as much as you like and at the same time save your soul. Otherwise, you will never see me again. Impressed by the strength of his decision as well as by the kindness of his expression, the hitherto indomitable woman agreed. Reconciled with her son's decision, she followed his example humbly. Rather soon, on the advice of the recluse Anthony, Theodosius was chosen father superior of the community because he was the kindest, humblest, and the most obedient of all. Let us turn to the chronicle which describes the life of the ancient monastery in these words. God alone can measure the sufferings that the monks took upon themselves by living within the narrow confines of the caves and feeding on barely bread and water. On Saturdays and Sundays, they ate a little boiled corn, and when they had none, were content with a few vegetables. They worked with their hands, weaving garments for their brothers, and exercising other manual trades. The wheat they bought were shared out equally among themselves. Ceaseless was the prayer in a small church dedicated to the Blessed Virgin built above their caves. It was only then that the monastery became visible to the people of the neighboring countryside, whereas beforehand it would not even have been suspected that the brothers were living in the caves. was a model to the others, not so much by extraordinary penances he undertook as by his devotion, humility, and good work. His asceticism was something private, almost sacred. He didn't want others to see. He wore a hair shirt but put on other clothes to hide it. He never lay down to sleep but remained sitting in a chair in his cell where nobody would see him. The chronicle runs, And so strong was the charity of our father Theodosius that when he saw a beggar or a man clad in rags, he wept with compassion and gave as an alms everything he had on him. He spent nights in prayer. During the forty-day Lent, he retired to a lonely cave and forgot everything earthly in his mystical sacred heart life. A divine harmony, a balance between the inward and outward feasts of a monastic life was the fruit of Saint Theodosius' spirit. The Saint Hegumen stated, What is principally necessary is that the youngest should love their neighbor and listen to their elders with obedience. The elders should lavish on the young love and instruction. They should teach them and comfort them. During the night, Saint Theodosius would sometimes stop praying to speak to those he found gossiping. He never gave way to anger and was always kind, gentle and charitable. But when he saw in the cells food and clothing in excess of the limit, laid down by the rule, he had them burnt, for he was certain that they were the devil's portion, 
since they had been acquired through disobedience. When a sheep of his flock grew weak in faith and left the monastery, the saint in his deep affliction would pray for his return. And when the brother came back, he would talk to him and send him to his cell in peace. One more narration from the Monastery Chronicle. On a dark night, before the fence around the church was finished, thieves made their way to the place and went straight to the church, hoping there to find many articles of value. From inside it, they heard singing and made off, thinking that the brethren were celebrating Vespers. Having waited a certain time in the forest, they returned, but once more heard singing and smelt the odor of incense and saw a strange light rising above the church. Having no patience anymore, the cruel robbers rushed on the church like wild beasts. At this moment, a miraculous event occurred. The church rose up in the air and became totally inaccessible. The monks who were with the saint noticed nothing. But the thieves in their terror fled away and promised never to harm anyone again. Their leader, repenting of his wickedness, visited Theodosius with tremor, and the saint thanked God for having protected the monastery and enabled the robbers to save their souls. The people talked of those monks who lived like angels on earth, the good works of Abbot Theodosius shining more brilliantly than the sun. The monastery of the caves grew. On church holidays, Theodosius had free meals served in front of the monastery for beggars, the blind, the paralyzed and the sick. Every Saturday he sent cartfuls of bread for convicts in the prison. If necessary, the meek abbot could be as firm as a rock. Prince Izyaslav of Kiev threatened to burn down the monastery having learned that one of his favorite boyars was deeply upset by his son's decision to become a monk of St. Theodosius Lavra. The royal rage subsided as soon as the prince read a humble but firm message from his saint. Do as you like, my lord, but it is not for me to turn away from their path the warriors of the King of Heaven. When Isyaslav's brother drove the legitimate sovereign out of the capital and invited Saint Hegumen to dine with him, Theodosius answered the usurper with these words from the scriptures. I will not go to Jezebel's table and eat food contaminated by blood and murder. Warned by his followers that the prince would seek revenge, he said calmly, Brothers, my heart is full of joy. Nothing better could happen to me. What have I to fear? Loss of wealth and property? Separation from my country and my spiritual children? We came into the world without any of those things. We were born naked, and so we leave the earth. And that's why I am ready to accept exile and death. days Theodosius remained simple, modest, and indifferent to any insults and jeerings of wicked people. One evening he was returned from the palace to the monastery in the prince's carriage. The coachman took him by his clothes for a beggar, made him drive all the way while he himself reclined on the cushion. 
At dawn he was greatly surprised to see the boyars greet the man with great respect, and the monks at the monastery bowed down to the ground. The chronicle concludes, Theodosius was respected for the purity of his heart and for the teaching which was inspired by the Holy Spirit. To him, a hair shirt was more precious than the royal purple. Now there is the monastery of the caves has reopened after years of neglect. It has been a witness of God's omnipotence to the vanity and weakness of atheism and to the heavenly prayer of immortal Theodosius for his monastery. been listening to another program in the series The Christian Message from Moscow devoted to the Saint Theodosius of Key. The story was written by Father Artemi of the Moscow Theological Academy. With this we end today's edition of the Christian Message from Moscow presented by the Voice of Russia World Service. Your host was Boris Novikov. Let me invite you to our next program in a week's time. And remember that your comments on the program are always welcome and of great help to us.